Over Christmas break, I had planned some activities for our family, including one night I was calling Bob Ross Night. We were going to watch an episode of The Joy of Painting on YouTube and then paint our own masterpieces, and they were going to be amazing. While we didn't have time to do this over the break, we did our Bob Ross Night a couple weeks ago, and I had an experience I want to share. We started the night by watching a couple of episodes of The Joy of Painting with Bob Ross. As a side note, I don't know much about his personal life. There's a new documentary about his life I have saved to watch, but man, was that guy ever nice on his show. He was so positive, and we were giggling at how many times he told us how easy this was going to be and how everyone can be a painter. Even in the episode we eventually chose, he told us how he used this very painting to teach a man who had never painted a day in his life and how that man had painted a masterpiece right in front of his eyes. He was so encouraging, so I was ready and ready to create a piece of art just like Bob Ross's. And then we started. Step one, paint the whole canvas black. Check, I could certainly do that. Step two, scrunch up a paper towel and blot white in the center to create a light source, and then work shades of gray around the edges to create snow. Check, I could do that too. Step three, paint some happy little trees in the background. Sounds easy enough. Bob certainly said it was going to be easy. That's where things went downhill. Because you see, I'm not a painter. I love making graphics in Illustrator and on the computer, but hand drawing and painting, they scare me to death. My happy little trees, they were awful. Bob told me I was going to take my tiny foam brush and start thin at the top and then get thicker as I came down the canvas. Nope, mine were full blobs of black paint coming down the whole thing. And the more trees I made, the worse they got. And don't get me started on the branches. They looked like alien arms. I looked over at my kids' paintings and their trees. They looked amazing. Mine were pathetic. So I did the only thing I could think of. I started painting black over the whole canvas to start over. I got some more paper towels, scrunched them up, and made more white and gray snow. And this time I got a piece of paper to practice those darn trees that beat me the first time. I spent about 15 minutes doing what Bob said with the side of that tiny foam brush to try to get my trees thin at the top and stubby little bases at the bottom. And this time, I got it. Well... Not like Bob's, mind you. There were still some alien arm branches involved, but they were way better than that first try. Overall, our family Bob Ross night was a success, even though at the end several of us had started over with black canvases. But we laughed, we ate too much candy, and had a great time. And by the end, each of the five paintings we made somewhat resembled Bob's masterpiece. I have those paintings ready to be hung up in our laundry room, all five in a row, mostly because I want to remember that night, but also to remind myself that being imperfect at so many things is completely okay. I think sometimes those small reminders are needed, especially to ourselves. And as Annette Funicello so flawlessly put it in her quote, life doesn't have to be perfect to be wonderful. This is Elizabeth and Liz from Simple Simon and & Company, and you are listening to Stitched. Today's episode is sponsored by Baby Lock. Crazy quilts have a long, sordid history that seems to be born from the phrase, necessity is the mother of invention. Although the name crazy quilt wasn't coined until the late 1800s, the process of using small scraps of fabric Patchwork together has been around for hundreds of years in quilting. In America, this technique of patchworking random fabrics together was made popular by colonist women. When bed coverings and coverlets that early immigrants had brought with them began to wear out, women found ingenious ways to patch them together with bits and pieces of worn-out clothing and other materials to keep their families warm at night. The worn section of such coverlets might be cut out or even patched on top of with pieces of clothing and other materials. Many such quilts were patched with trouser material next to red wool from long underwear and plaids from shirts 
as well as calicos from dresses. And although these quilts may not have been the prettiest in terms of their design, they did their job and they did it well. Many quilt tops from this era had layer after layer of fabrics placed and hand sewn on top of each other to make them usable for everyday life. And with this ingenuity, the idea of crazy quilting in patchwork was born. Now, as for the term crazy quilts, most quilt historians believe that the term crazy quilting was born when two Japanese art exhibits came to America and were put on display at the Philadelphia Centennial Exposition in 1876. The first, a silk screening, silk painting exhibit, and the second being a Japanese pottery exhibit. While American manufacturing at this time period was focused on mass producing goods, the Japanese pottery exhibit displayed in Philadelphia came as a stark contrast. It focused on the beautiful details of hand-created, one-of-a-kind, exquisite pieces. The exhibit included beautiful bowls and vases unlike Americans had ever seen before. Crazing, a Japanese term for tiny cracks put into the glazing process of pottery, became a very popular technique that was regularly used in many pieces after that art exhibit. And Americans could not get enough of it. Crazing made a piece of pottery look as though it had been cracked into a million tiny pieces and then meticulously put back together again. Also, the hand-painted silk screening and hand-stitching of the exposition inspired American women. These art pieces included new and unique embroidery and painting patterns that resembled floral motifs, fan motifs, and even spider webs. Satin stitches, feathers, herringbones, and chain stitches were also widely seen in this exhibit. Both the pottery with its crazing and the silk screening exhibits were a particular success and were written about in many newspapers and magazines of the time. Now, we do need to diverge in the story here to talk about one other piece of history that also attributed to the rise of the crazy quilt phenomenon there in the late 1800s. And that was the establishment of an upper class. Before this time period, women were making things out of necessity. And because there were only so many hours in the day, and because quilting only served a utilitarian purpose, these quilts were not always viewed as works of art. But with the rise of manufacturing in the United States starting in the Progressive Era, there also came a generation of women who did not need to work as hard. They had more money to pay people to do the menial, everyday tasks and they could lead a life with much more time on their hands and no dirt under their fingernails. And one of the ways these upper-class women found to occupy their newfound time was by hand-stitching, which was deemed as a wonderful way for American Victorians to use their talents. So, with the rise of an upper-class of women who stitched, the Japanese pottery technique called crazing, which, as you remember, created works that looked as though they had been broken into pieces, and put back together again, along with the magazine and newspaper attention given to this technique, the American love affair with crazy quilts was now officially underway. Today's episode is sponsored by Baby Lock. Want a sewing machine that's a jack of all trades, yet small enough to take on the road to a class or even a friend's house? then it's time to celebrate because you found it. The Jubilant Sewing Machine is ideal for a variety of sewing projects like quilt piecing, smaller home decor, and even basic garments. It's a machine that gives you plenty of genuine opportunities to let your creativity shine. You can find the Baby Lock Jubilant Sewing Machine at your local Baby Lock dealer. Crazy quilting rapidly became a fashion statement in the progressive era with wealthy, upper-class women. They sought to use the wide variety of fabrics that the newly industrialized 19th century textile industry had to offer them and piece them together into single quilts made from hundreds of those different fabrics while showing off their hand embroidery work. Interestingly enough, most crazy quilts from the Victorian period were not made to be used as quilts at all and included no batting or filling. They were made purely as decoration. 
pieced on smaller scales, these quilts were made by taking tiny bits of all different types of fabric and sewing them on top of a foundational piece of fabric using hand decorative stitches, usually very ornate fabrics. Silks, velvets, and damasks were used, and elaborate stitches from fine metallic thread would have been chosen to create a piece of art such as a crazy quilt. These crazy quilts were used to cover the backs of chairs and as early table runners for dressers and chests, or to be used as lap robes when visitors were over for tea in parlors across wealthy homes in America. These decades were the golden age for entertaining and parties for the upper class, and crazy quilts were used as a status symbol in this era to decorate and show off a lavish lifestyle. Fanning the flames of crazy quilts already wild popularity with its portrayal in many women's magazines of the day, mail order crazy quilting kits were advertised with lavish fabrics and other materials that were purchased to make expensive and grand crazy quilts and lap robes. Patterns for stitches and spiderweb motifs were printed and decorations for making crazy quilts could be found in most newspapers of the time as well as in popular magazines such as Harper's Bazaar. And it was these magazines that used the term crazy in many other aspects of the upper class's Victorian lifestyle, making it both chic and trendy. For example, throwing a crazy tea party meant to use mismatched dishes and invitations. And crazy themed parties were also much admired. In fact, all things crazy became pretty popular from the 1880s until the early 1910s. Making crazy quilts was also popular for fundraising among upper-class women. There are even stories of quilters writing to famous people asking for just a small piece of their clothing that could be incorporated into a crazy quilt they were making to raise money, to help children in far-off lands, build a new hospital, or other worthy charities. Women would often brag about the pieces of clothing or fabric that were in their crazy quilts and use them as conversation starters. As in all fads, crazy quilts soon died out in the upper class population, but not before they had grown to great popularity in rural parts of the United States. This style of quilting continued in small towns and prairie farms, where quilters adopted the patterns of the urban quilts but employed sturdier, more practical fabrics. Corduroys, flannels, and denims were most often seen. And as for the stitching, well, they also dropped the use of upper classes ornate metallic thread for thicker cotton threads that would stand the washings and wearings that the crazy quilts would need in prairie homes. And while many of the crazy quilts of the upper class have disintegrated over time, mostly because the silks and velvets used to create them were manufactured with metallic sheens that destroyed the fabrics, these prairie crazy quilts that were made on a larger scale with full batting and layers still remain intact. These crazy quilts, although well used, have survived in family hope chests and dressers throughout generations. A symbol of pieced patchwork that may look crazy on a small scale but its imperfect perfectness gives way to a beautiful work of art in American history. I think as quilters, we sometimes get caught up in the perfect trap. When someone looks at one of our quilts, usually one of the first things we blurt out is, oh, don't look too closely, or please don't look at my corners. We tend to point out our mistakes, to belittle our efforts, or to think that our quilts will never be good enough. But I think we can learn something pretty powerful from those crazy quilts of old. It's not the perfectness of the piecing or the corners that make it a work of art. It's the effort. It's the love and well wishes that are stitched into each and every piece of that quilt that make it beautiful. It's the different fabrics woven together to create a masterpiece. So thanks to Annette Funicello, I think the new motto for every quilter should be Quilts don't have to be perfect to be wonderful. And they don't. Next time you open your mouth to say something negative about your own quilt, just close it. 
and repeat that saying to yourself over and over again if you have to. Quilts don't have to be perfect to be wonderful. And then believe it. Because that's the way quilting and life is meant to be. Alien tree branches and all. For more stories, projects, and quilt tutorials, visit us over at www.simplesimonandco.com where you can find scores of quilting patterns and inspiration. Thanks for listening, and if you have a minute, please leave us a comment or a review, especially if you're listening on iTunes. It only takes a few clicks, I promise, but it helps us out so much. Now, stay tuned for I've Got a Notion. Seam rippers were most likely invented sometime in the late 1800s. One of the earliest patents for a similar tool was a thimble, but it had the addition of a small knife that was patented in the United States by W. Miller in 1883. This tool was used not only as a thimble, but to rip threads in a similar way. Later, a patent exists for a tool designed for the sole purpose of ripping seams, this time in 1898 by John Fisher from Canada.